Bonjour à tous. Ça me fait un petit peu drôle de vous parler sans avoir le plaisir de vous voir en, en face de moi, en personne, mais c'est la vie qu'on doit mener dans cette ère de la COVID-19. Mais c'est malgré tout un immense honneur d'avoir été choisi pour présenter la conférence en l'honneur de Mark Weinberg, l'un des plus grands chercheurs québécois, mais surtout un être humain extraordinaire que j'aurais eu le plaisir de côtoyer pendant plus de 20 ans. Hello everyone. It is a great honor for me to be chosen to give the Mark Weinberg lecture for CAR 2020. Mark was one of the most brilliant scientists in Canada, but he was also an incredible being whose generosity has touched many lives. I would like to begin by acknowledging that this presentation is taking place on traditional unceded indigenous lands. The Kenyan Kehaka Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which I give this conference today. I'm recording from Montreal. Teotiake, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations, ancestral indigenous territories of the Abenaki, the St. Lawrence Iroquois, the Huron Wendat, the Algonquin, the Mohawk people, and the Métis and Inuit people. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other people. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our going relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Here are my disclosures. So what I'll try to do, I would like to take, through the, to take you through the path of evolution of prevention strategies over time and how my work may have contributed to our current knowledge. I've always felt that to reach our goal of HIV elimination, we need to focus not only on primary prevention, such as condoms and PrEP, or secondary prevention, such as treatment as prevention, but also on tertiary prevention, making sure that people affected by HIV are protected against complications of, of their disease. Mark Weinberg has been an inspiration throughout my career. I was attracted not just by the discovery of 3TC and his pioneering work on HIV drug resistance, but mostly by his fearless approach of telling world leaders the truth and make them accountable. This always struck a chord for me from my youthful past when our idealism was great and gave us strength to try to transform the world. Mark realized that you had to capture the three fundamental elements in fighting disease, science, political will, and community involvement. Who else would have the most at stake in finding solutions to a problem than the affected individuals themselves? If, if you were still with us today, although he would be sad to see the number of deaths mounting in our country right now due to COVID-19, I bet we would see a little sparkle in his eye. Wow, a new virus. So much to learn. Let's write a grant. He would be on the front lines denouncing the disorganization of our healthcare facilities for seniors. He would encourage communities to apply social distancing measure. He would be there. His values were constant, scientific rigor, searching for novel ideas, speaking truth to power, working with and for communities affected, communicate science in a meaningful and comprehensible way to the general population. I share these values and I've tried to apply them in my practice, in my research projects and in my life in general to the best of my ability. The first step is remembering the goal elimination of HIV. We have come a long way in our prevention approaches and although biomedical prevention is now at the cornerstone of prevention strategies, it took several scientific discoveries, patients, activism, and political will to get us where we are today. In order to prevent, we need to know what we're dealing with. When the first cases emerged and were characterized as mysterious illness affecting the gay community in New York and California, these communities mobilized and started asking questions, wanting to understand what was happening and requesting treatment and help. It took a few years to discover the virus, thanks to Francoise Barry Simouzi's team and the Gallo team. This allowed us not only to develop diagnostic tests, which is imperative if you want to prevent disease, but also to better understand its mode of transmission. Vaccine efforts started right away, but have been frustrating ever since. Antiviral therapy had an uncertain start with AZT being quite controversial. Babies were being saved, but patients who had improved started deteriorating after a few months. 
Activists led the fight for the development of new and better drugs. It took a few years before science understood the mechanisms of drug resistance, which eventually led to the concept of combination therapy. Once we had therapies that worked, it took political will to make them available globally, and this goal has still not been achieved. So far, prevention has been based mostly on behavior, behavioral changes, condoms, sexual practices, with varying degrees of success. Circumcision had been demonstrated to be effective in large clinical trials and cohort studies. Now the stage was set to evaluate biomedical prevention. The first one to be evaluated was treatment as prevention. This was done primarily with the pivotal trial HPTN052. Although there had been evidence that HIV treatment could impact HIV transmission from mother to child transmission studies and PPE, HPTN052 was the first randomized clinical trial that clearly showed a dramatic effect on transmission. The data published uh, in 2011 and then 2013 showed that in a cohort of 1,763 serodiscordant couples randomized to early or deferred ART, there was a 93% reduction in risk of transmission with early therapy. Another trial partner was an observational study in 888 serodiscordant couples in their, and their HIV-infected partner was on suppressive heart and condoms were not used there were no link transmissions recorded in any couple after the 1.3 year follow-up. At the same time, researchers were already working on animal models of HIV prevention by drugs. And that's called now PrEP. Here is a graphic that shows all the trials conducted on PrEP in the last few years. You will note that when the IPREX results were released that showed 44% efficacy, some people looked at the cup as halfway full others as halfway, half empty. So the IPREX study gave, um, showed a 44% efficacy as compared with placebo. Um, it, it turned out that later on, we discovered that the rate of success was clearly dependent on adherence. Overall, when we look at all these early trials that were done, some of them in women with very disappointed uh, result, other in zero discordant couple, um, certain guidelines started to emerge in particular from the CDC. In Quebec, an expert panel convened by the Ministry of Health and made the recommendation that PrEP could be used in a specific context where the physician evaluated that it was appropriate. These were timid recommendations, but it gave access to PrEP for most physicians. Still more questions needed answers. As I mentioned before, the drug efficacy depended on the level of drugs that were in, in patients receiving PrEP, so uh, clearly linked to adherence. So then came Ipergay, on-demand PrEP. The thinking was people have different lifestyles. It may not suit everybody to take pills on a daily basis. We might increase adherence if treatment was taken around the period of sexual activity. This hypothesis was supported by macaque models. So it was not enough for Mark to have contributed for the development of new drugs, to have fought to make them available for most, most people in Africa. He also wanted to facilitate studies on PrEP. He was contacted by Jean-Michel Molina fr from INRS, and he put together to participate in the Hypergay trial, and he put together a group of people who might be interested in conducting the trial in Canada. He first reached out to community representatives, and I show here Ken Monteith, who is the director of the COXIDA, and has been involved in HIV research since its, its beginning, to get their opinion and invited them to participate. This was a controversial trial because it used a placebo control arm. Some clinicians were reluctant to participate. This is when I came in. Mark wanted a clinician to lead the study as he would be more interested in looking at resistance profile that might have emerged during the study. So we set up an impressive research team with clinicians, basic scientists, social scientists to study behavioral aspects, as well as community representatives. representatives. And then we developed a protocol for Canada. 
And this study would not have been possible without the extremely, extremely appreciated support of the CTN, who backed us from the start to the end of the study. The uh, study design was uh, simple. Um, it was a, a treatment arm with uh, tenofovir FTC uh, against placebo. The scheme of administration is known to everybody, two pills before, one pill one day after, one pill one day after the sexual activity. And overall, we randomized 414 patients. And we were extremely happy to see that after um, uh, 20 months of follow-up, the uh, protective effect was 86%, so an 86% reduction in the relative incidence of HIV. Of note in this study, the incidence of HIV in the, in the control arm was quite high, 6.6%. Per, per so we also noted that there were no major changes in sexual behavior, but there was a high rate of STIs, which was, which was already present at the beginning of the study. And the, absor the observance of the medication was quite good, people taking on average 16 pills a month. No adverse event, um, particularly uh, important, were noted. And there was only mild uh, issues with lab studies. So what happened was that um, if you look at all the PrEP studies that have been done so far, when Hypergay and Proud study, which were published at the same time, came, came up, it became clear that PrEP was going to be a major, major player in the prevention armamentarium with high, high level of, uh, of success. But then um, we knew that one thing that could impede this, the use of PrEP widely was going to be the cost. So I joined a team of... Uh, um, modelist, uh, people in our institution who study um, the cost effectiveness. Um, and, and we did this study that was published in the Canadian Journal of Infectious Disease and showed very clearly that PrEP, um, given as demonstrated in Hypergay, was highly cost effective. So then we went on to do the open label part of the study. Again, uh, 900 and 200, I'm sorry, 299 uh, uh, completed the follow-up. And what it showed was even better than the initial study. So in all patients who continue to take PrEP, there was a 97% relative reduction versus uh, the placebo arm. So this was a confirmation of the success of PrEP and that uh, we should uh, definitely implement it widely. Um, there were some behavior studies that were embedded in, in this particular study. And what we found was that low users of condom before were less likely to resume condom during the open label phase. And uh, systematic users of PrEP during the uh, double blind phase were less likely to resume condom during the um, open label phase. But overall, people chose a way to protect themselves, so that was a positive outcome. And of course, STIs were also very, um, uh, there was a high incidence of STIs. So Hypergay created a mine of data. Some of them have already been published. Some of them are still being analyzed. It also gave the momentum to create observational studies to evaluate the efficacy and safety of PrEP in real life settings, such as the French observational cohort study, which has been published and presented in several trials. I decided that it was important for us to continue our efforts in Quebec in order to provide PrEP to very vulnerable individuals who did not have sustained contact with the healthcare system and could not have access to PrEP otherwise. So I set up the cohort Protège with these objectives in mind. It is a prospective cohort. We wanted to enroll initially a thousand patients, but it was not possible due to funding, due to uh, um, time constraint. So we enrolled 350 subjects and decided to follow them longitudinally for a five year period. We offered a combined prevention approach based on counseling, provision of condoms and PrEP. 
So the, I, this is a summary that was presented at Journée Québécoise a few years ago. So data on 334 participants, the median age was 35 years old. Three participants were seropositive at screening. Uh, they were in the, uh, their acute infection phase, which uh, underscored the importance of, of uh, testing people before they start PrEP. Um, and we referred them to treatment and, um, and care. So in our cohort, we gave the choice of, to participants in what kind of modalities they wanted uh, to have, and the majority chose on-demand PrEP. Um, we know uh, uh, there was a very high rate of STI with gonorrhea reaching an incidence of 40% in our cohort. Um, there was uh, half of the, our population that uh, used drugs, uh, mostly alcohol, cannabis, and poppers, not as much as um, of the other drugs that um, uh, are affecting large communities in Canada. So what we found through the first uh, steps of, of this cohort was that personalized care necessitates a lot more time for nursing, counseling, community workers than we had planned initially. There were several visits for the follow-up of STIs, and we uncovered a lot of other health problems, which speaks to the fact that these people uh, did not um, encounter the health services regularly. They were people who don't go to hospitals, don't go to clinics, even to specialized clinics. So vulnerable individuals are not statistics, and we saw a lot of human drama being lived every day. One man abused with limited mental capacity, he had no money to take the bus to come to his appointment, but he wanted to be protected. We had foreign students coming from authoritarian families with no money to pay for PrEP. We had individuals unable to negotiate condom use with partners, telling us I do what they want me to do. So there was a lot of situation that makes you understand that it's not everybody, if you don't outreach for these people, that will come naturally to the clinics to get tested and receive PrEP. So we have all these measures for prevention and yet we're not reaching our goal of 1990-90. Why? We've made progress in the MSM community, but we have identified a subgroup, a subgroup of more vulnerable individuals who do not connect regularly with the healthcare system, foreign students, mental health issues, for whom further efforts need to be deployed. Was also interested in looking at our ability to screen and diagnose other populations at risk. So I reached out to Joseph Jean Gilles, the director of GAPB, and asked him if he would be interested in an outreach project for screening for HIV and HCV people coming from endemic countries. He was quite enthusiastic about the project. We discussed it a lot, and uh, we were interested in looking at a decentralized approach for testing. So we decided to use a mobile unit that would go into neighborhoods with a high proportion of immigrants from Africa and the Caribbean and do the testing. This really was a project anchored in the community at all levels, from preparation of education material to contacts with community leaders and deployment of the CARAF mobile. So when we look at the uh, portion, the, the, the characteristic of the individuals that we screened in these uh, neighborhoods, we see that um, uh, many uh, were Canadian citizens, even the majority, and uh, some of them were uh, people requiring asylum, some of them were refugees, and some of them were permanent residents in order. Um, we asked them how often they would be tested for HIV. And uh, for a lot of people, 44%, it was the first time they had never had a, an HIV test. For those who had an HIV test, some of them had, had it, it done a year ago, but most of them, it was a long time ago. And if we asked them where did they get their test, most of them, 67% had gotten it in Canada but some of them had gotten their test only in their country where they came from and had never been tested in Canada. So overall, um, we solicited 3,400 individuals and 1,008 people were enrolled in the study. We only had five rapid tests that were positive, of which two were known cases already. There were nine positive HCV tests. 
participants were mostly men, heterosexuals, um, 97%, black 82%, with an average age, as I said before, of 34 years old. Most were from uh, Haitian descent, 44%. 47% thought they were not at risk because they had a single partner, and 35% because they didn't have any unprotected sex. And 74% accepted to get tested to know their status, and 90% would not have gotten tested if a rapid test had not been offered to them through our mobile unit. And I think this is the most important point that we can uh, take from this particular study. So although we did not detect a lot of new infections, the project was a success because it brought a lot of visibility to get the efforts to increase screening and sensitize various populations about the need to be tested. Then, as director of the Réseau FRSQ SIDA, I held a meeting with researchers and community members to determine where we should put our efforts to improve outreach to vulnerable communities. Observations from Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and BC had shown us that vulnerable Indigenous people might be at risk for HIV and HCV infection. And to date, no studies had been performed in Quebec to evaluate the situation. This led to the ENCOUNTER study. We first reached out to a wonderful young researcher, Carrie Martin, who was then directing the Women's Shelter, and who agreed to participate and lead us through the project. Gilbert Raymond developed the protocol, and we established a collaboration with the CLSC Metro, the uh, Institute, in National Institute of Public Health in Quebec, and other indigenous researchers, such as Sylvain Baudry. I facilitated the conduct of the study and provided medical supervision. So we had the collaboration of many uh, community organizations to help with the recruitment and testing. We reached our recruitment goal of 200 participants and the final analysis was conducted on the 173 participants that were enrolled first. There was a good distribution of, uh, of uh, First Nation Métis population of note, uh, we had 51% of our population that were Inuit, and in Montreal, only 5% of all indigenous people is Inuit. So there was an overrepresentation in our study sample. Most people in the study were uh, relatively young, from 35 to 54 years old, uh, 60%. And uh, so younger than the uh, overall indigenous population in Montreal. And most of them did not complete high school. So that was a, um, a, another characteristic of our, of our study. We were interested in, at looking at the mobility between Montreal and, and their home community uh, to see if there was a risk of uh, people, let's say, who having HIV in Montreal would go to their community and eventually transmit infection. So overall, the mobility was quite low. 33% uh, reported traveling in the last year, but they didn't travel often, um, and they didn't stay there often, and they, um, most of them did not engage in high-risk behavior when they were traveling. Um, there was a lifetime prevalence of STI of 48%, and of note, 20% did not have a RAMQ card, which is our health uh, system card. Uh, STI, um, so 9% had the uh, chlamydia and 8% had the uh, incident gonorrhea because we tested for, for these. And if we look at the HCV um, positivity rate, so 48%, 21% tested positive for HCV and 48% had chronic infection, HCV infection. Of those, 64% uh, had the history of IDU but 36% had no history. For HIV, we asked them uh, if they had ever been tested for HIV and 87% said yes. 83% um, in patients with RAMQ and 65% in patients without RAMQ. So here it can show a little bit of the discrepancy in, in people who are less likely to go to our healthcare uh, clinics. Uh, Two-thirds had been tested in the doctor's office and one-third in the community-based organization. 
Nine out of 10 were highly satisfied with the service they received. One out of four had not gone back to obtain their results. And the reason for not testing, people were saying they had other priorities. So 33% refused to have the HIV rapid test or to have the result of their tests given to them. We found that there was a, a, a 6.4% rate of positive tests. Most of them were already known and already in care. So how does this compare to other studies? Prevalence of HIV among indigenous people in prison, Ontario, 11.7% in females, 5.5% in males. In another study in Toronto, 5.7%. So we have to, I have to remind everybody that this was a, a targeting a very definitive um, particular population of very vulnerable indigenous people in Montreal. This does not reflect the rate of HIV or the other characteristic that I just showed of the general indigenous people living in Montreal. So that is very important, but we wanted to characterize this facial population in order to see if there were more services that we could, um, that could be organized uh, by them, for them, uh, in order to improve their health. So again, as I said, uh, uh, a subgroup of indigenous living in precarious contexts in Montreal, um, risk factors for HIV were frequent and explain a high prevalence of HIV and HIV infection. Migration patterns to home communities were limited and few engaged in high-risk behavior. Nine out of 10 had been tested for HIV. Only two out of 10 felt they were at risk. And two-thirds of participants had people they could count on for help. And one and half of participants looked into their culture for help. So there were really um, interesting uh, findings in terms of uh, bright moments, in terms of uh, the solidarity network that existed in, in inside this community, and also uh, lessons to be had in terms of how to improve uh, the health services. So there is still much to be learned on how to provide better access to testing and to care for this vulnerable population. The team learned a great deal at each step of the study. We received help from elders like Mike Standup and Canadian Indigenous researchers who share their experience in conducting these type of studies and better understand cultural safety in research. I feel we have built long lasting ties and hope it will contribute to the development of new generation of Indigenous researchers in Quebec who could lead future projects. So we've gone through a lot of different um, pilot project or initiative that were research initiative that were done to better understand how we can improve um, our services and how we can um, come closer to our 1990-90 goals. Uh, we should ask for better culturally adapted health services, diversify options for marginalized individuals, increase mental health services, and continue research efforts on new forms of biomedical prevention. Most of all, PrEP should be free, as well as our ARVs, no copay. Finally, I wanted to say a few words on tertiary prevention. Once you have contracted disease, to prevent its complication. I have been intrigued with the question of aging with HIV ever since I observed in my hospital an increasing rate of myocardial infarction in relatively young patients. This led us to perform an epidemiologic study in Quebec, which demonstrated clearly the excess risk of, of myocardial infarction, as has been shown in other studies such as that. So in order to better understand the pathophysiological mechanism behind this phenomenon, and possibly identify predictors of cardiovascular disease in people living with HIV, I set up a pan-Canadian cohort. We first applied to CIHR in their comorbidity um, grant application in 2013, um, developed the pan-Canadian cohort on HIV and aging, which we call SHACS. And in 2018, Madeleine Durand took the leads of, of, of SHACS and is now the PI of the study. As you can see, Madeleine is in the middle of the picture, uh, along with a fellow um, uh, ex-CTN fellowship uh, recipient, Ali Genadia and another recipient of a grant for comorbidities, uh, Marie-Josée Brouillette, uh, who works on neurocognitive uh, disorders. 
So we all know that uh, because of the success of art, people are living longer, and now they're going to be susceptible to all comorbidities season, seen in the general population. And age is a major risk factor for all of these comorbidities. So what contributes to the risk of comorbidities in HIV? Of course, we have the immune system, the virus, the therapy, and the host genetics and lifestyle. So they all come together for the perfect storm to increase the risk of complications. So just to describe a little bit the goal of the Canadian cohort on, uh, on aging, um, we ultimate goal was to identify biomarkers that could predict early cardiovascular disease and eventually being able to treat patients. Uh, from, um, ahead of time, or to identify potential therapeutic targets. So there's a main cohort that's been followed, that's going to be followed for 10 years now. And we have sub-study, the arterial st st sclerotic plaque, the glycemia, the immune profile, and the genetic profile. And of course, uh, we have patients coming from all sites in Canada. So I'm just going to say a few words on two of our sub-studies. The first one is the cardiovascular imaging study that is, is led by Carl chartrand Lefebvre, who is a radiologist at our institution. And what he set up to do was to find the best way to image uh, coronary arteries, carotid arteries, and uh, to image vascular inflammation in order to characterize better the disease in HIV-infected patients. So basically, it, it, this is done by scan, CT scan, with um, uh, uh, contrast uh, administration. And what we can get uh, in terms of data is uh, the, to measure the lumen of the coronary artery, to, to characterize the plaque of the atherosclerosis, and to, to quantify the calcified plaque and to study the non-calcified plaque, which is more frequent in HIV-infected people. And to analyze, they found a way with their imaging computer um, analysis uh, to uh, characterize the vulnerability of the plaque by looking at the lipid portion of the plaque. So they, we did a, a couple of studies, uh, one showing the plaque volume and uh, and looking at a um, different um, uh, attenuation stratum. And what they found was that the, one of the best uh, marker to characterize uh, the plaque in HIV infected people that was more distinctive was the low attenuation plaque volume. They also looked at another way to uh, try to uh, infer the degree of atherosclerosis by looking at the epicardial fat volume. And they found that there was a, quite a nice correlation between the two, which might give us a way, an easier way to um, assess um, cardiovascular disease. The other uh, part of our sub-studies that we're looking at are the immune um, correlates of, of cardiovascular disease. So I'm going to talk about some work that was done in my lab by Mohamed El Far, that who you see in this picture, uh, who, who uh, thought of this project. He identified IL-32 as a novel cytokine with a as a potential biomarker, uh, and built a solid research program leading to um, our lab obtaining an NIH grant and uh, and some CIHR funding. So. I, we know that IL-32 is involved in several cardio inflammatory disease, including cardiovascular disease. So we also identified in the lab a molecular signature associated with aging. So using all of these um, data, uh, we have the hypothesis that IL-32 can affect the immune cells in the atherosclerotic plaque. So one of my students, Hardik Ramani, is now working on evaluating the potential mechanism with which IL-32 may impact cardiotropism in T cell. Um, the other uh, aspect that he's looking at is the uh, uh, how IL-32 may impact cardiotropism in monocyte. So he's looking at two different cell types, and we're, we're hoping to show 
uh, in the next few months, how um, uh, this can could be used either as a biomarker or as a uh, target for treatment uh, to prevent uh, plaque rupture. Another of my students is looking at uh, identifying ligands and receptor to IL-32, which hasn't been discovered yet. So this was just to give you a few examples of the type of work that's being done on the Canadian HIV and aging cohort. There is a tremendous effort uh, done by Madeleine and her team to uh, put together all of this um, uh, clinical cohort. They're measuring frailty and we're gonna have data coming uh, from these studies uh, soon. And I think it's gonna contribute to uh, our, a better comprehension of the um, uh, premature aging phenotype we focused on and cardiovascular disease, but this will might, might be applied to other phenotypes. So I wanted to end by thanking everybody who has been working with me for all these years. Um, this, these are people from my lab who have been doing all the IL-32 work. In the middle, you'll see Mohamed El Far was the, talking to you. Uh, before, and the woman beside him is Annie Chamberlain, who's been with me for decades and has been the pillar of my lab um, as a research coordinator and has done a tremendous job, and the others are the students. I also want to thank um, everybody involved in the Canadian H HIV and aging cohort, in particular, um, uh, Stephanie Matt, who is also the, uh, my clinical research coordinator, who has been with me for many, many years and is the pillar of my research um, clinical team, and the nurses involved in the recruitment and the follow up of patients, Marie Gocal and Serge Cote, and Sudar, who is involved in the database and uh, data entry. Again, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, all the Hypergay participants and the CTN for supporting this effort and Gilead for support, supporting the trial. And for Coar Protège, again, uh, Stephanie Matt as the coordinator, but the two nurses who have been spent so much time and energy and compassion with our participants, Chantal Beauvais and Pascal Arlotto. And again, the sponsor, uh, who is Gilead, the Réseau FRS Cucida and the CTN. And overall, I would like to thank everybody for your patience with this uh, virtual presentation. And I hope to see you in person next year.